Hi, my name is James Downer and I'm a 2016 AMS Fellow. Um, I work at the University Health Network and Sinai Health System. I am a critical care and palliative care physician uh, in Toronto. I'm a 2016 AMS Phoenix Fellowship recipient and I'm very, very grateful for the support I've received uh, from AMS uh, through their Phoenix project. Uh, the funding has enabled me to move forward substantially on a couple of projects that I think are really important and that mean a lot to me. Uh, and I'm hoping that they will pan out and mean a lot to healthcare in, in the years to come. One of the projects is a project focused on bereavement and bereavement support. Uh, I work in an intensive care unit and our, the mortality rate in the average intensive care unit is in the 20 to 25 percent range. So a lot of people who come into an ICU unfortunately don't leave. Uh, and a lot of Canadians uh, die in or shortly after an admission to an ICU. Uh, so we deal with mortality in the ICU all the time and we have a certain level of skill and experience in supporting people at the end of life in the critical care environment. However, once they've died and once their family members leave the unit, they are often lost to the system. And this can become a problem. We know that when someone dies in a critical care environment, their family members are at higher risk of experiencing what's known as complicated grief or some type of severe grief reaction. So we know that family members are at increased risk of depression, uh, substantial psychological psychiatric symptoms, increased use of healthcare resources, uh, social isolation, and even uh, health problems. They're at greater risk of cancer and heart disease in, in the years to come. Um, we currently have no system set up to routinely follow and support these people. And it's been routinely flagged and identified every time people have convened panels, of uh, patients, physicians, researchers. This is something that comes up time and time again. And we really just don't have anything in place or really anything even in the works to try to routinely reach out to family members to screen them for needs and then to try to meet them. The project I want to put together is trying to look at a very pragmatic way to approach that. Um, we are aware of certain interventions that can be helpful, medications, certain types of intensive therapies that can, that can help people with severe grief reaction. Um, the, the problem is that, of course, many of these resources are not easily scalable, um, and we're not likely in this funding environment to get substantial new resources to try to meet the needs. You have to remember that more than 260,000 Canadians die every year. Uh, which means that uh, that's almost 1% of the population. Um, and if each one of those people is leaving behind one or more family members that might be at risk, uh, you rapidly outstrip any ability uh, or any resources you have to address that. So you need something that's going to be scalable, something that's not going to depend on a lot of new money or a lot of people. Um, fortunately, from our background work in this area, we know that many of the healthcare providers in the critical care environment are very keen to get involved. They recognize this is a problem and that if there was a system set up where they could divide the work amongst uh, themselves and given a bit of time and, and training, uh, actually do a bit of this outreach, use an existing relationship with those family members and follow them up in the weeks and months afterwards just to see how they're doing, seeing if they're struggling or if they're succeeding um, and, and maybe try to figure out if there's something we could be doing differently to help them, you know, connect them with important services give them some resources or even some simple interventions that might help them with their, with their experience. And then in the more extreme cases, get them connected with, with psychiatry, psychiatric resources, uh, that this is something that, that might be of value. It's a tough task to undertake a project like this. We have to bring together people from many different uh, fields of medicine, so palliative care, critical care, psychiatry, uh, also allied health like social workers, uh, spiritual care providers, nurses, of course. And um, uh, so trying to bring together players from many different fields and then bring together the expertise, uh, trying to get the expertise from the literature, review it and see what's been done. And very rapidly you figure out why no one's tried this before because it's not that easy to do. But over the course of many months and thanks to the support of the AMS Phoenix Project and the fellowship, I've been able to dedicate some time, put aside some time, and put together a team, look over the data we have, look over the literature, and start to come up with ideas and convene meetings among, among you know, key stakeholders and, and experts in the area to try to figure out what we can do and what is likely to work. 
and, and then put together a project that uh, I think we're all pretty proud of. We, we were able to run this past a number of different research groups. We've now got a national team representing all the different disciplines, all the different professions uh, that would be involved. Uh, we have more than 14 ICUs that have signed on to the project uh, in uh, multiple provinces. We've engaged, uh, you know, internationally recognized resources like the Canadian Virtual Hospice, uh, and we're going to be contributing to, to their work in this area, and they're going to be contributing to our project, so a, a really good partnership. And it's, it's really through the help of the AMS uh, and through the resources that they've been able to devote to the project that, that we've been able to pull this off. The other project that we are working on as part of the fellowship is an automated tool to try to help identify patients who may be nearing the end of their life. One of the big problems in how we deliver high quality end of life care to patients and family members really is a very upstream problem. Uh, we know that healthcare professionals are just not that good at identifying patients who may be nearing the end of life until they may be in the final days or even hours, we are just not identifying these patients early on um, uh, that, that might benefit from the palliative approach or the palliative care approach. But if we were to come up with a system to reliably, routinely identify patients uh, and accurately identify patients who may be nearing the end of their life, uh, we would probably be in a much better position to start delivering the, the care that they need or addressing their unmet needs. There was a model that was recently developed here in Ontario uh, using just simple administrative data that was very, very accurate for predicting patients who were in the final year of their life from the time of an admission to hospital. And that's an important milestone because most people are admitted to hospital more than once in the final year of their life. So it's a good opportunity to, to try to identify those patients. Um, so our project was to use this model and try to use it in real time to, I, to flag those patients while they're in hospital, and then send notifications to the teams that are taking care of them to say these, these people uh, may be at risk of death in the next year, they're at elevated risk of death in the next year, and here are some suggestions for what you might be able to, to do about it. Uh, you know, things like addressing their uh, goals of care, discussing advanced care planning, if that's not being done, uh, screening them for, uh, high, for symptoms and suggesting ways that you might be able to treat those symptoms looking at potentially reevaluating some of the treatments they are receiving, whether there was a surgical treatments that are planned, or perhaps some of the medications that they might have been taking for years that may no longer be relevant to their condition. And then ultimately, are they, are they in the right setting now for somebody with their needs? Would, this, would their needs be better met in another facility? So just some simple prompts of things that we would do for anybody that we suspect would, would be in the final year of their life. But delivering it at the point of care, to the frontline care providers. We know that our ability to meet the needs of dying Canadians in the coming years is going to depend heavily on frontline providers doing what they can. And, and so this project was aimed at capacitating those individuals, augmenting uh, their decision making, and giving them just in time uh, education and, and resources to try to help meet their needs. We were able to get the project off the ground and, and have some very encouraging results uh, from just the pilot. Um, and, but the project needed a lot of supervision and needed a lot of babysitting to get it through. And uh, it was the support of the AMS Fellowship that let, let me set aside some time so I could accomplish that. Um, without that support, I, I, I think we might have struggled. Uh, and, and so I was deeply grateful to receive the, the support of the Fellowship uh, to, to accomplish this task as well. The task of improving compassionate care is a very big one. The task of improving end-of-life care for all Canadians is a big one. There's no one intervention or one project that's going to fix everything. As somebody who works on the front lines and delivers this end-of-life care and is often involved in, in managing and, and treating patients and family members of patients who are nearing the end of their life, you do see the impact of, of care and compassionate care when it's delivered well.